for the second speaker of the day, uh, we're happy to have uh, Shantanu Day, uh, who's a Russell Chandler III professor uh, in industrial and systems engineering at Georgia Tech. Um, Shantanu's interests are broadly in non-convex optimization, including uh, mixed integer, linear, uh, non-linear uh, optimization. Uh, and he's, he's also interested in applications in uh, power systems and process engineering and statistical learning. Um, and uh, today he's going to tell us about some new result in, in solving uh, semi-definite programs. So please, Shantanu, take it away. Uh, can okay. I uh, can uh, jump, in, jump in really quickly and say Shantanu also worked a lot on maximalist free sets in the past. So there's a strong connection with the previous talk. Um, also, it's probably not, maybe not the right place to mention it, but I don't think if I will have another time to say it, but Shantanu is the first winner of the Aegon Balish Prize uh, from the Informs Optimization Society, and I want to congratulate him personally from, uh, I think he's a very, very deserving winner of that. Um, he kind of stands for a lot of what Aegon stood for with a mix of theoretical and practically relevant work, um, and I'm, yeah, very proud to have him here today. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. You're very kind. Thanks, Elias. Thanks for inviting me. You guys can hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Okay, very good. And this, you can see the screen as well, right? Yes, all good. Uh, so this is a paper that uh, just recently got published and uh, just got accepted in math programming. This is joint work with uh, Greg Bleckerman, uh, who's a professor at Georgia Tech, uh, Marco Molinaro, who's at uh, Rio, professor, and Sending Sun, who's a PhD student. Uh, at, at, at Georgia Tech. Uh, so uh, let me uh, let me quickly uh, try and motivate. So my apologies, this is this talk has not so many direct connections with discrete optimization, but perhaps some connections in the sense that for a lot of discrete and non-convex optimization problems, we want to solve SDP relaxations, which you know are, as you all probably know, is optimizing some sort of you know variables or matrices, and 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 you're trying to minimize some sort of a linear function subject to linear constraints and your matrices must be PSD, which is uh, which 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 means that the matrices must be symmetric and 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 basically you know uh, if you compute the quadratic form for any vector u u times x u should be non negative and 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 so this is well known this is a convex cone and 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 there's beautiful results that that and algorithms uh, to sort of solve this class of problems uh, and in fact, there's a lot of recent work, which uh, you know, I, I'm not an expert in this area, where you know people have really scaled uh, solving SDPs. But uh, it still remained a challenge in some sense. And 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 there is one way that you can think about solving SDPs. Uh, so one nice property of a matrix that is PSD is that uh, basically, if you look at submatrices, so principal submatrices. When I say principal submatrix, I mean Pick a some subset of columns. Pick exactly the same, same subset of rows, right? Uh, so sorry, columns, rows, and, and, and that's a principal submatrix, right? So these principal submatrices are also PSD. So that's that's a nice property. And so uh, what what can do is say instead of solving the PSD uh, constraint on all the whole matrix, you could say why not just apply to a selected subset? Okay. So so, so let me take some k by k principal submatrices of X and apply. The PSD nest now in the smaller submatrices. So obviously, this pro new problem that I have uh, is is a relaxation because, you know, if it was PSD, then it would satisfy these conditions, but not the other direction. And why would I want to do this? And why this relaxation might be useful? Uh, this is if you are thinking of solving your SDP as a as a, in a uh, using cutting plates. So the way you would try to solve them is that you would ignore your PSD constraint completely. And you would you would just have a linear program where, where you're optimizing a linear function over polyhedral linear constraints, and then what you would do is after solving that, you would get some x. You would check whether it's a PSD matrix or not. And if it's not, you can add a cut to represent the PSD nest because it's a cut that separates your current x from the PSD cone. PSD cone is convex. So you can do this, and you know it's obvious how you do this. You look at your x if its eigenvalues are negative. You know, corresponding to that, you can do things. Uh, and, and, and so why this relaxation really makes sense is that when you're enforcing psd ness on k by k principal matrices, the linear inequalities that you add uh, through sort of a cutting plane mechanism would be sparse. And sparsity really helps in computations. Uh, so I, I'm not, that is not directly the topic, but it, this is the motivation and I def, and you know, all my co-authors I believe are here so they can explain much better than what I can. 
but, but so the next slides are uh, thanks to Alex who actually made these slides. Uh, so Alex, Andrea, and, uh, and, and, and Gonzalo and I, we've been looking at sort of looking at these sparse cuts and this is just one picture, probably is the best picture from the slides that, that Alex sent, but, but and, there, and I'm lying and cheating a little bit, but, but bottom line is, uh, you know, there was some sort of quadratic non-convex problem that we were trying to solve with SDP relaxation. So basically we were trying to solve this relaxation of the non-convex problem. And, and, and what we did is instead of solving this, this we, we, we said we're going to add cuts only from these sub principal sub minors, but now these cuts are going to be sparse. And as you see here on the x-axis, as time goes, uh, this is the gap closed. And you see that for this, this at least this example, these sparse cuts are doing uh, much better. Uh, and, and the reason is nothing miraculous. It's really that linear programming solvers can really exploit sparsity. And the answer of why this is working so well is that if you see then the dense cuts, the time to solve LPs is increasing. In fact, there are examples where we saw that it was continuously increasing, but it's significantly higher than what you would take to solve it. So essentially what is happening in this picture is that while the time is constant, the number of rounds of cuts that you can add is far more. I mean, we're talking about orders of magnitude more of rounds of cuts that you can add compared to the dense cuts. And so you're getting a lot more progress. Uh, so any case, this was just a motivation. Uh, and by the way, feel free to stop me. If you have any questions, please feel free to stop me. <coughs> so, so we, you know, and, but you know, we, we were not the first to look at this. There were, uh, you know, there was a very nice paper by, by, uh, uh, by uh, Franco Marco, uh, Pietro Bellotti and, and Kolitsa, uh, you know, who tried this earlier uh, with some success. Uh, recently, there's a really nice paper by Ruth Meisner, uh, Pierre Bonami and Dirta Mantani uh, and, 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 and this person uh, is at Ruth's lab, I think just graduated. Uh, my, my apologies, I can't remember his first name. Uh, and and, 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 and it, it's also been used in other application areas. So for, for example, I worked a little bit in power systems where we've seen that actually just enforcing uh, sort of the PSD-ness on very small sub matrices uh, really gives you, buys you a lot. Uh, and, and there are some theoretical connections, which I'm not going to talk so much about, but for example, uh, Ahmed, uh, 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 Amar Ali, you know, has, has this sort of hierarchy, uh, which, which he uses, uh, you know, these diagonal dominant matrices, which somehow are related to the dual of this problem. And, and, and some duals of what I'm trying to look at have been looked at by other people. Uh, so there are connections and this is not in some sense uh, just come out of the blue. So, you know, there are reasonable reasons to study this object. Okay, so, so you've we've already seen in this previous uh, slide that clearly computationally this may not be such a terrible idea uh, to try and sort of put your, uh, put your money on sparse cuts because they really help in, 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 from the sort of linear algebra perspective. But there's always a trade-off because obviously this problem here was a relaxation. And so, of course, if I had infinite time, I expect this problem here, the first, the real SDP, to give me much better bounds than this sparse SDP. So the question really is that, that, that well, how much better is, 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 is SDP to sparse SDP? That's what we would like to understand. And that's sort of, this is what I'm gonna try and, 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 and present you in the next uh, 15 minutes. Uh, now, as it turns out, usually these questions are super difficult to answer. And so we can't answer this question. And so we are going to take an easy way out. Basically, what we're going to do is get rid of most of the question, okay? So we're going to get rid of the data. We're going to get rid of the site constraints. We're going to get rid of the objective. All we'll study uh, and that we can try and understand is, okay, this is a code. So if I look at N by N matrices that are symmetry and that are also PhD, this is a convex code. I can also look at all n by n symmetric matrices, where, for example, instead of some selected, if I take, in fact, for selected also it's a cone, but that's again complicated to analyze. So I'm going to get to the selected. If I take all k by k principal sub matrices of this matrix and I enforce PSD ness on them, this is also a nice pointed closed cone. And so I can try and understand, you know, the difference between these two objective functions by trying to understand how different are these cones. Now notice that obviously a P matrix as PSD obviously lives in this because for a PSD matrix, all K by K principal matrices are PSD. So this cone here 
is a much bigger cone than this. And I really want to understand how much bigger is it? Is it very large or is it not so large compared to the PSD cone? Because that would reflect in terms of how good or bad this relaxation is. Any questions? Okay, all right, so let's let's move on then. Okay, so formally I'm gonna call this matrix, so, so the cone where the <coughs> cone of matrices where which are symmetric and where I enforce PSD-ness on all K by K principal sum matrices as the K PSD closure, okay? And, and as I said, I want to know how far is, and, and by the way, I'm gonna use the notation S and K to represent that the matrices are in N by N and K to represent the fact that every K by K principal sub matrix uh, is, 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 is PSD. Uh, I want to know how much bigger, really, I said far here, but really what I want to know is how much bigger is this from this cone of PSD? And again, just to make connection with the notation, S and N would be S and plus, okay? Uh, all right, so how can we do this? Uh, basically what I want to do is there are obviously matrices here that are not PSD. So I want to know how far are those matrices from the cone of PSD matrix? Now, you have to be careful when you ask a question like this because this is somehow in some sort of an unbounded question. You have two cones, so obviously, you know, if you have one matrix here that is not in this cone, if you know, it's a cone, you can keep going further on, you would be at infinite distance. So, so you have to you, you have to set the question up properly. And so really you have two questions to, to set up the question, you need to, 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 to set two parameters. One is you need to normalize the problem, okay? Uh, so you can't go off to infinity. Uh, and the second is how will you measure this distance? And so what we'll do is we'll use the Frobenius norm for both of these things. So in other words, we will have this notion of distance bar, uh, F here standing for Frobenius norm. And so what we're asking is, look at all matrices M whose Frobenius norm is one, okay? And that live in this cone S and K. Now this is my normalization. So I just don't go off to infinity. And then I'm saying, okay, look at all matrices that are Frobenius norm one that live in this cone. And what is the distance from the SDP cone? And among these, among, among all such matrices, I want to find the worst one, which is the farthest one. And notice this distance is nothing but formally saying, what is the closest matrix to M, uh, which is PSD. Okay, so this is our notion. But again, if, if the math is getting, the algebra is getting too much, uh, ignore that. Basically what we're saying is, look at all matrices that have Frobenius norm one, that's some sort of normalization, that live in this bigger cone, so that's a bit like taking a cone and chopping it off and then saying in this chopped sort of space, which is bounded, look at all the matrices that are in S and K, which is the, what is the farthest matrix of the PSD cone? Okay, and I want to understand this as a function of N and K, so this will give me some idea of what's going on. All right, uh, so what are the main results? But before that, is the, is the question clear? Is, is, there, is there anything I can do? Uh, Good for me. Okay, thank you. All right, so I, 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 I move ahead. <coughs> uh, okay, so first what we want to do is we want to upper bound the distance because upper bounds always help because you know, we, want, we want this distance to be not so large. You know, that's our you know, sort of hope. So upper bounding this distance helps. Uh, and so uh, our first upper bound is, is, okay, is, is saying that this distance is, 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 is upper bounded by this expression. I should, I, should, I should clarify one thing to me. Notice that because Frobenius norm is one and the distance is measured as a Frobenius norm, the largest you can go away is one. Why? Because the, you know, the matrix where all the entries are zero is in this PSD code. So, so the largest this value can ever be is one. So this number is always basically going from zero to one. If it is zero, that means everything that had Everything that is in SNK is essentially in SN plus, which would never happen. Uh, and if the distance is one, that says it's basically terrible. Like really the matrices are really far away, okay? And so the distance, so the result here is, is, is this, and, and then uh, what does this expression say? A better way to think about this expression if you approximate a little bit, is it's saying that essentially it's some sort of linear. All right, so this is really, you know, just replaces denominator by N, and you can think of this as N minus K over N. 
So it's sort of linearly, linearly, this is linearly varying as you vary k. So when you put k equals to uh, two, so every just two by two block is, uh, this is the so-called SOCP relaxation. Then basically the error is really close to one. As you can see, it's n minus two or n. Whereas of course, if, if k was n, I was putting the PSD constraint on the whole thing, then this is zero and so, so, so this, 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 this. Okay, what we observed uh, in some sort of experiments and so forth is that actually this bound is decent, that this bound seems to be much better when k is small. Uh, and really this bound is not so nice when k is really large. And so we were able to come up with a different bound, uh, which is particularly tight when k is very close to n. Uh, this is sort of more for a mathematical uh, interest, less than computational interest. When you do computations, you probably want, don't want to keep k close to n. I mean, then you might as well have just done with n, but we still want to understand what's going on. And it turns out that when, you know, you can actually prove a bound, which is something that looks like n minus k over n, the same thing that we had, but to the power three over two, but the, you know, there are some constants and so forth. So this is not, and then there are some assumptions and k has to be sufficiently large, but this is a second bound that you can prove which is basically incomparable to the original bound. But essentially what I'm saying is when K is closer to N, okay, this cone is get, becoming closer to the SDP cone at a faster rate. So initially it is kind of linearly getting better. So when K is small, it's linearly getting closer and closer to the SDP cone. But as K becomes you know, closer to N, it kind of goes at this rate of three over two. And you can check that these are somehow not related bounds. Okay, so now we have these two upper bounds. Uh, <clears throat> what do we want to do next? What we want to do next is we want to say, well, how good are these bounds, right? We want to understand how good these bounds are. Uh, and so well, how would we do that? We have to actually somehow come up with lower bounds. In other words, what typically these lower bounds would be matrices, explicit constructions of matrices where we can show that these bounds are tight. Right, that actually these match these bounds, uh, and, and in fact, that's how the proofs go. Uh, uh, so, what is our? <coughs> turns out we actually have uh, some a number of different lower bounds. So let me quickly go through. So, our first lower bound looks like this, and and, and again, this looks like a very complicated formula. But the, let's 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 parse through this. Let's first think about what happens when k is small in this formula. So, you have n minus k, and you have this k minus one square times n. This is sort of like a cubic term and this is sort of like a quadratic term. But when k is small, this term here is really small. So let's ignore that. So what this distance looks like is it just says n minus k divided by square root of n square, which is n. And so basically it's saying that our first theorem is tight up to some constants when k is small. And in fact, I don't know how much time I'll have to show to proofs. This distance comes from one particular family of matrices where I vary k uh, for a fixed n, you know, which is which is in this cone S and k. And let's uh, uh, let's now look at what happens when k is really large. Well, if k, n minus k is a constant, which means k is really like n, little bit off. Well, then notice that this this denominator this is now a cubic term because this k minus one is really like n. This is like n cube, and this is like n square. So this dominates, so I can ignore the second term. And so basically what do I get is something like a constant divided by n to the power three over two, because there was a square root. And this you see is exactly the rate I got in the second theorem when, 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 when k was very large. So basically what we have is that we have these two upper bounds and it's clear that these two upper bounds really do explain the phenomena of the distance between these two cones when, when k is very small and k is very large. Uh -huh. But what happens when, when we are somewhere in between, when k is not so, well, you know, let's say k is n over two. So it turns out when, when let's say k, k is n over two, in other words, let's say k is a constant of n. So it looks like something like this. Uh, the previous lower bound, it turns out, looks something like this, which says that basically as n goes off to infinity, this lower bound goes off to zero, whereas our upper bound is one minus r, it's a constant. And so, we don't have a tight example here. Uh, and so maybe, you know, we have, uh, we have these upper bounds that are tight when K is very small, K is very large, but we don't have the right understanding of the upper bound when, when K is somewhere in the middle. Uh, but turns out, okay, so what we can prove is that there is another family of matrices where you get something like this, where K is a constant times R n, okay? 
So, you know, n over k is a constant r. And where we can prove a distance which is as a function of r. And so it does not go off to zero when n goes off to infinity like this. Now, this one minus r and this numbers obviously don't match. Uh, and so there's obviously a lot more work to understand these things. But at least we also have a family where we can show that if you're looking at a regime, let's say, which says, well, again, this is r, you know, okay, there's lots of. Uh, stuff and some factors thrown in and because of the way the arguments go in. But, you know, basically it says that, okay, yes, there are families of matrices where you can construct where this distance is just a function of n over k. And that does not go off to zero when n goes off to infinity, which is sort of like what our upper bounds look like. All right, so I have five minutes, I believe. So I, I let me see how much, uh, oh, maybe I should, uh, yeah, is that, uh, yeah, let's, yeah. Uh, yeah, five five more minutes, and then we can take questions after. Yeah, 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 and, and yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so, so maybe one more result. So now, obviously, you know, all of you are thinking this that okay, when I do k, really, what I'm trying to do is when I'm trying to separate this cut, I'm really trying to select a cut from n choose k. And in fact, there are reasons to believe that the separation of the sparse cuts are actually far more difficult than the dense cuts. Uh, it's np complete. You can show that. Uh, we, we show that in the paper, uh, you know, together with. Uh, uh, Alex, Andrea, and, uh, and, 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 and Gonzalo, uh, uh, because you know, there's n choose k choices and this, this is not so nice, but it turns out if you're actually studying these distances, you can relax this constraint uh, and you can give like a probabilistic result, which basically says, if you select about something like, let's say n square, uh, let's put it as n cube, right? n square log n, okay? And you have these constants delta. If you basically pick about order n square of these, these principal sum matrices randomly, okay? You have to select them randomly. And then if you enforce that the PSTNS are of these random sub matrices, n square of them, remember that n choose k, n choose k is very large, okay? n choose k is approximately n over k to the power k. This is just n square. Then essentially, you know, with some probability one minus delta, where delta is this parameter, you're within an, you can show that this object that lives in this sort of random cone with very high probability is one plus epsilon times this upper bound here, which was our first upper bound. Remember this was, this was our upper bound. Uh, this was the sort of the first upper bound we'd show. And the intuition for this is, it's not surprising in the following sense. The thing about PSDNS is it's a very strong condition. And you know, even though there's n choose k of these sub matrices, you know, you know, once you start enforcing them on some of them, you kind of enforce them on, on, on kind of the neighboring PSDNS in some in some sense. Like it's you know, you cannot really create these crazy things where you enforce like about n square of these PSD uh, constraints of PSD, and then you still have like you know a lot of craziness going on in some sense. You can obviously. But then you're not too far away from the object that you, the original code. And so that, that, that is the intuition that says that, yeah, yes. And, and, and in fact, in the experiments also we see, we don't actually have to use, you know, n choose k or too many cuts. You know, we seem to make progress with the reasonable amounts of cuts. Uh, and in some sense, this may might, might, might explain what's going on there. Okay, so I really have just a minute or so. So I, I, I would have liked to show the proof because there's some very interesting connections to some theory in, 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 in um, sparse regression and uh, restricted isometric property, uh, but maybe, maybe, maybe on a different day. So I think it's uh, instead of trying to force all the proofs right now, I'll stop here and, and I'll take questions. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Santanu. Um, Okay, so Alex, do you wanna? And obviously, since you guys can read very fast, that's the proof. So, <laughs> so now you know the proofs. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, have time for questions because you went um, below the time that we allotted for oh. this. Um, but I don't know, maybe we should just take the questions into the breakout room so that people can ask in a more individual session. Is that okay with you? I'm fine with everything. I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I guess thank you very much for uh, Shantanu and Felipe, uh, these two uh, theoretical but also practical talks. Um, I love both of them. Um, and please stick around right now for the breakout rooms that you can ask them both questions or hang out here in the main session in which uh, you'll be able to 
um, you know, just chat if you want. 